um, the staff at the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego, for supporting this lecture, and also the staff at UCSD for their wonderful um, work in making this possible. So it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Catherine Canjo, the David C. Copley Director and CEO at the Museum of Contemporary Art, San Diego, who will introduce tonight's esteemed speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. When you say it's a great pleasure, everybody thinks the artist is coming up, but but it's it's just me. This is this is a team program, as as um, Amy said, and it's it's one of our favorites because we're we're very pleased to be able to link these two great cultural resources here in San Diego, the University and the Museum of Contemporary Art. So thank you for attending. This is the first Russell lecture we've had back in the museum since we've expanded the building, um, and. By now, I hope you all know that we doubled our space in this expansion and quadrupled our, our galleries, which means uh, more space for experiencing art, um, thinking, and having fun at events like this. Um, with this partnership with UCSD, we expected this to be filled with all university students, but I think they're live streaming. But I wanted to tell them in particular that thanks to the Qualcomm Foundation, I want them to know that all folks who are ages 25 and under get to come to the museum free. So we really want them to, to come and take their time in the galleries and experience us um, time and again. Uh, but it's through programs like this that we get the direct connection to the artists. And we are very delighted to, to welcome Elliot Hundley um, to, to speak to us tonight. Um, Elliot came down from LA, and I tend to think of Elliot as this, you know, consummate Los Angeles artist. He captured everybody's attention when he graduated with his MFA in 2005. But point of fact, I mean, he's he's a southern southern man, born born in Greensboro, North Carolina, um, and received his BFA from the Rhode Island School of Design. So he has this. He's he's covered the map, but we claim him here. Um, and his work, you will see, references the past and the present, evoking um, art history and mythology alongside prosaic and even underwhelming um, imagery from our modern world. And he works in a variety of media. That's this, you know, we say this expression, mixed media. Well, we mean it with Eliot. I mean, there's painting, drawing, sculpture, collage, photography. It's all there. But I think for many, um, uh, People associate a particular material with Eliot's work, and that's the, the pin, the, the straight pin that on one hand um, evokes, you know, your, your grandma's sewing chest, uh, but, or also, you know, a sort of scientific specimen of, of pinning, pinning down um, a butterfly. And I think it, the pin might be an, an item that we associate with Eliot's work, but I think we should think about the verb of pinning. Um, another word that we talk about with Eliot is collage, that, he, that, that things are, uh, are mixed up and maybe cut up, but I think it's important to, that he emphasizes very often this act of pinning and uh, bringing the work together. And we might think of that as repair or rearranging or reimagining connections between the past and the present, high, low, abstraction and the referential. So we'll see what Eliot has to say about that. Um, to just talk a little bit more about his um, credentials, um, Eliot has been included in many exhibitions in the US and abroad. And for a lot of us, just last year, we can't get out of our heads this riotous exhibition that covered 20 years of his work, which was, which was produced at Regan Projects, his Los Angeles um, gallery. It was like a museum show, and the world was awed when they saw these 20 years of work um, in that exquisite space. Um, so museums were a little abashed. You know, but other museums have done one person shows as well. The Wexner Center for Arts in Columbus, Ohio, the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas, the Hammer Museum in, you know, LA. Um, and his work is included in many um, important group exhibitions recently, the um, Prospect New Orleans, the, the fifth edition of that, which was 2021, group exhibitions at the Parish Art Museum, the Moscow International Biennial of Contemporary Art, he's been in group shows at the Broad, San Francisco, MoMA, MoCA LA, the Istanbul Museum of Modern Art, and again, the Hammer, Los Angeles. Um, 
And in addition to his artistic practice, um, or maybe as an extension of his artistic practice, Elliot has curated exhibitions, um, including the uh, exhibition, the inaugural exhibition called Open House, which is a group show that he created for the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. Um, he is a recipient of a, a Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, a Guggenheim Fellowship, 2019. It seems late, Elliot. I would have thought you got that earlier. Um, and is in the collections of The Hammer, our friends in Los Angeles, Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Louisiana Museum of Art, which is, of course, in Denmark, um, MOCA LA, MOMA New York, the Nasher in Dallas, the Paris in Miami, SF MOMA, the Guggenheim Museum, Vancouver Art Gallery, Walker Art Center, the Whitney Museum of Mar Art, and the Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. So somebody asked me earlier, how do you choose these artists? And we try to find an artist that resonates both with the, the faculty and students and the, the um, uh, the, you know, the program at, at the university and with our curatorial interests in our collection. And we're very fortunate to have two works of Eliot's in the collection. Um, Tharsis for Eno, I'm probably mispronouncing this. Thursis for Eno, Thursis for Eno, which is a sculptural piece. Um, here's what we say when we mean mixed media. Metal, pin, string, plastic, wire, spray paint, found, found, magnifying glass, goat hooves, sandbag, and coconut shells. The registrars love Elliot. Um, and then, then we have a more traditional painting in many ways, this, it, with the title, Still Life with Skull, from 2013, um, which is oil on linen, as well as collaged inkjet print. Um, and very recently, um, as part of our Alexis Smith exhibition, Elliot made a contribution to, to the catalog, to the publication, creating an um, artist a visual essay in the book called Roll Credits that, that uh, many people enjoyed at, uh, in, the, in the back of the book, the final conclusion to suggest um, the resonance of Alexis Smith's work. So that's a long introduction to, to, to give a bit of context um, for Elliot Hunley, who we're happy to welcome to, to the podium. Thank you for that. That was very kind, and I'm embarrassed. <laughs> um, thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, so I wanted to, uh, let me go to the first slide. I wanted to give a, a sort of layout for the way that I'm going to give a lecture. It's not very natural for me to present or speak about my work in this way. Um, I have a lot of images and a lot of slides, and I'm going to go through them very quickly. I, because I'm a terrible editor, but all, and I might just totally glide over some images, but I also feel that it's in some way, it might be frustrating, um, but in some ways I feel like it's a good approximation of the feeling of my artwork, because the artwork is um, too much. It's too much to look at, too much to process, too much to remember. And um, so in a way, I'm allowing the presentation to do the same. I um, also encourage, I kind of have given, sort of told this story about myself for 20 years, and I watched a version of it online today to remind myself what the story is. Um, and I don't want to just repeat myself, so I welcome anyone to interrupt me and ask a question for clarification or to throw me off my uh, patterns or habits. Um, I include this early painting because I, I began making art as an abstract painter. I was making gestural abstraction, and I enjoyed it, I loved it, but no one saw the meaning in it that I did. Uh, so I, I realized early that I wanted to work with narrative and representation um, to tell the stories that I actually saw in the gestures of abstraction um, that, that just weren't conveyed. And I wanted to do that, one second. I wanted to do that in a pretty expedient way. I didn't want to, I knew how to draw, I know how to paint, 
representationally, but it's, it's incredibly laborious, and I didn't want to take the time to be really good at it, which is very hard. Uh, so I decided to use photography, and I took pictures of the people in my life um, who I wanted to make artwork about and who were readily available, and I simply cut those photographs out, and they're like the normal size, like a three-inch size image of a person, and then built tableau dioramas, just like a shoebox around them, as a way to create paintings quite easily. And this was in the days of film, so I would um, build the little diorama and then dispose of it before I developed the pictures. So it was a way for me to explore representational painting and also think about the gesture of the body in, an, in a new way, just like I saw gestural abstraction doing. Um, and this is the work that I made as an undergrad. And I kind of, I kind of see sort of my art practice as like a snowball. And um, it's a, a, totally a practice of accumulation and momentum and gravity. And, and this is, uh, I've located that this is the moment that it started. Um, in 1997, uh, and it, I was in school. So, and it was my final work. And then I got out of school and I was amb re really ambitious in anonymity and uh, decided I was gonna make these huge photographs and build this giant tableau and, and I couldn't technically do it. I was completely unable to execute this vision. And after about three years, I decided to take all that mass of material that I'd accumulated and simply start making art out of it as collage instead of trying to make the photographs that weren't happening. Um, and for me, that was really formative because I realized that I, all I needed to do was accept the defeat to begin to progress. And this is called Alessandro Seated. It's made of the 28 poses of um, the Villa of Mystery Cycle, which is a triclinium fresco in Pompeii, which is about 2,000 years old. It was my attempt to explicate the, the painting, to understand it and reconfigure it through. So it's my version of a copy. It's about four by four feet. And then I took that further, and this is about seven by seven feet. It's actually made of 49 panels from a sketchbook. Um, so I dissected my sketchbook and made it into a quilt, and this was an attempt to think about failure because I had learned that lesson, and it's actually entitled after Teal Eulen Spiegel's Merry Pranks by Strauss, which is an incredibly rigorous work of music about a joke and about um, basically pranks. Pranks are just, are, and it's called Stupid Song. And it's also narrative in that there's almost like a comic book sort of sequential reading of it. And then in making that work, so it's quite large. It was the size of the wall that I had in my mother's living room. And, um, and it was, I made a big mess and I was cutting out thousands of things to make this piece. And I realized I made it and I was, whatever, satisfied with it. But I also realized that the room that I was in and how I transformed her living room into this pretty extreme domestic space full of bowls of cut up people and magazines, and that, that was more interesting than the artwork. So, just in thinking about that, I just thought, well, what if I don't glue any of this stuff down? Because if I glue it down, I kill it. So I just got a piece of foam and pins, and that is why I started pinning all of these things together. This is four by four feet. It's called Vesuvius, and it's completely made of these cut-up photographs. This is called a clearing. It's also four by four feet. This is a pretty seminal work for, for me. Um, 
It's an exploded landscape. It's sort of the last. I made a series of these works, and it was sort of the, the one that really lingered with me. And I actually made a show at Regan a couple of years ago based on this artwork, which I might talk about if slides come up. This, will, this format will replicate itself, where I just continually get closer to works as I progress. So this piece is called Cave. So I made those other artworks by pinning elements to foam. And then I thought, well, this foam is absolutely arbitrary. It has no meaning. So what if I removed it? And um, I s started cutting apart and pinning together mini blinds to make this piece, which is five by five feet and about a foot deep, called Cave. It also has magnifying glasses and toothpicks and photographs. And, um, and then I was thinking about sort of the breaking down the, you know, in, when you remove the panel, you, that's the border, that's the frame, that's the arena on which you make the gesture. And I decided, I, I was interested in the pen because it undermined my authority, this idea that I was controlling the picture and making some resolution that was, um, that you were subjected to. Like I wanted to empower the person looking at the, photo, at the image and the painting to know that they could make up whatever they wanted to make up about it. And I, I basically lined the wall of my studio at the time. And this was in graduate school in about 2002, so 20-some years ago, with all with foam, and basically decided that I would do whatever I wanted to. In a way, it was like a performance. I would simply do w what occurred to me over the course of the year. And when the year was over, the piece was done, and that was it, without any sense of authorship but it, you know, it's an illusion. And this is called Deathless Aphrodite of the Spangled Mind after Sappho's Fragments. And then in response to that, I did the opposite and made this piece, which is eight feet by 10 feet. I found about 150 landscape paintings from the 1940s that were mass produced and not special and um, cut them apart and reassembled them into one painting and inverted the landscape so the skies were on the bottom and the mountains were on the top and called it landslide. But it was an attempt to be very controlled, very decorative. Oh, and this is a work on paper. And I'm removing things. It's called Lydian Work subtraction and then I wanted the works on paper to have the uh, bodily sense you know a physicality and sculptural quality and sense of interactivity and I thought a kite is a good form to put to to translate for works on paper so I made a series of kites this is called lure this is a piece called bell glass which is also an attempt to make painting more physical and theatrical and performative. And I was increasingly sort of slipping off the wall. This is a kite called Monument. Um, so the, are the performances of the photography recorded? They're, only, they're almost recorded like a Mui bridge. They're not recorded with video, but they are recorded so thoroughly with photography that you, they could pretty much be stop motion animation. They're, and they're not, the, and that's the way they read in the piece too, that there's just minuscule movements between, it's almost rep repetitive. I like the idea of this, I mean, this was made in 2004 maybe, and it's called Monument, but it's really an anti-monument. And there is a depiction of an altar or monument within the piece. And this is a theme that recurs. The idea of like destroying my own artwork or its inevitable disintegration. This is called proscenium. It's a kite that's about, I would guess, maybe 16 feet tall, double-sided. 
and it divided the gallery into two spaces. The proscenium is the wall between the stage and the, the audience of the theater. This is a, my first exhibition at the Hammer Museum. This is called Fire. It's, you know, Rauschenberg um, de de decided to call his artwork Combines and Calder called his forms Mobiles. And both of them did so to justify a new form. And this was my attempt to create a hybrid of those two. And the title Fire is really simply you know, speculative. I'm sort of asking you to burn it or imagine it destroying it. This is called The Wreck. And I had been attempting to make sculpture for years and decided to employ the same strategy I had before and embrace my failure or my inability to re sort of resolve it. So I simply took all the failed sculpture and bundled them together and pinned them together into this ikebana called The Wreck. This is called Garland. This hangs from the wall, so you see it from the side like a, like a funerary wreath on an easel. But then when you see it from the front, it's all white. So the seven foot depth kind of collapses and is almost invisible. And then this is Garland as well. And it's simply a, a reiteration of the same idea. I didn't want to s quit working on the piece, so I decided to simply, you know, resolve it and begin again in a new way. And I've done this piece quite a few times, which is another iteration of the, almost like the photography of watching a figure move in space, watching a sculpture animate itself. And all the while I'm continuing to make gestural abstraction, though they are beginning to, there's emergent landscape references and spatial references. These all have titles, but I don't remember them. And I was making all this artwork about artwork, making people reenact paintings and figures. And what occurred to me was I was making artwork about mythology and that I should do it more directly. So, so I did. This piece is called The Invention of Drawing, The Hanging Garden. It's a double-sided work on paper that's about seven to eight feet long and however tall. And it's two mythologies superimposed on one another. The invention of drawing is actually a myth. Um, it refers to a scene where a ceramicist daughter, who's referred to as the Corinthian maid or Cora of Sician was about her lover was about to go to war and she poured water in the slip or the clay and then took the mud and traced the silhouette of her lover on the wall and that is the first drawing and the second and that okay so that that is this side and this side is called the hanging garden and it's about the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, which the king built a monument that it was basically an artificial mountain covered in gardens to remind the love, his love, the queen, of her landscape of birth. So it was a way to, to satisfy her, keep her, you know, give her her landscape in his home. So they were two myths about holding on to love. And this, this, I always, this is my mother. This, she is, she is really, uh, what's the word? Like it was her living room that I was making that thing in and making a mess. She's very, um, supportive but even indulgent and she's this is her playing Medea who killed her children so she you know every basically I'm lucky and that almost everybody in my life is up for this and um, this I like this example because it shows this is that first image of my mother 
So this is the piece made from the photo shoot. But, you know, this is just a, whatever they call it, like a wintergreen, it's printmaking, basically, on rice paper in a sculpture. So, like, you know, how the, how these narrative images come into the piece is, is often very suppressed. And, you know, there's a whole reason that the form of this construction is the way it is, which is, you know, about the myth of Medea and chaos and logic of the Greeks versus the Eastern sort of mysticism and on and on. But, and this is a side view of that piece. This is an example of a photo shoot at my studio, and this gives a sense of the studio is really a pretty chaotic, layered place. And I kind of I think of the artworks as almost like crusty things that I chisel out of that room. As I worked with mythology and wanted to move deeper, I realized the way to move deeper was to work with literature. And this is the first body of work that I made. It's called Hecuba, and it is a Euripides play about a mythological story that is the aftermath. It's a revenge myth slash play about the aftermath of the Trojan War. And it's gruesome. This is a sea thrash thing. It tell, it's this inspired by the story of her son who is cut apart and cast out to sea. This is Some Poured Leaves Over the Dead Girl, which is the narrative of her daughter, Polyxena, who's sacrificed for no good reason. This is called Blinded, which is the moment of revenge, where she gouges out her neighbor's eyes after showing him that she killed her, his sons. This is called Troy to the Dirt. So in this place, I've found a, a, a place to contextualize the gestural abstraction slash landscape painting as a set dressing. And this is the Bacchae, which I spent about four years. It, the Bacchae is also by Euripides, like Hecuba. And it is... Um, even more gruesome, and it's a revenge play with a supernatural twist, so it has a sort of paranormal uh, element. Dionysus is a god and seeks revenge for the death of his mother, Semele, who was struck by lightning by Hera. And these are depictions of the various characters. The photography in this case is becoming sometimes a tableau in and of itself, not just for discrete excision. This is my friend Angina playing Dionysus. This is Semele. So these photographs were made to produce this body of work. These are the sculptures and the, to give you a sense of the proportion of the, whatever the paintings and the, Sculpture. This is called agave, eight feet by 16 feet and a foot deep. At this point, I found pins as long as eight inches. So it gets deeper and more unruly. This is called Pentheus. The text of the scene of the character is cut out in ransom letters and inscribed in various translations in the background of the piece. So, so the narrative is actually accessible, though difficult to decipher. The, those are magnifying glasses which train light like spotlights on the various figures and also create vignettes and invite closer viewing. This is called Dionysus. I think of these as billboards that are like advertisements for a movie that doesn't exist. This is called Eyes That Run Like Leaping Fire, and it is, tells the story of the moment of possession of, 
a certain character when she kills her son. There's a string curtain that hangs in front of this piece and obscures it. And I also thought of it like, it's like a horror movie, but also like, I know that what I'm doing is absurd and I can't actually horror, I mean, conjure fear. So I thought about doing it like a Lawrence Welk sort of vaudevillian sort of presentation of horror. Yeah, another question. So to everybody hear her question, how important is it for a viewer to know the story that I'm telling? Um, I actually think it's not necessary at all. And it may seem sort of navel-gazing, but the story is really for me. So I, I hope that these artworks would inspire people to learn the story, and that then if they were to see the artwork again, it would sort of be like it was unlocked, and they could move deeper into the artwork. But really, the story is a way for me to make artworks about the nuances of psychology and emotion and theater and history. Um, it's a template. Yeah. So this is called The Lightning's Bride, and it's the moment that Simile is struck by lightning. It is very clearly, you know, inspired by Mui Bridges' stop motion photography. It's, I want to say, four times six is 24 feet long and eight feet tall. It has two magnifying glasses in it that were from the 50s that were used to put in front of televisions to make them feel bigger. There's um, the text in each panel is a different a translation from a different year, so you can read the same story and understand culturally what was changing about the way it was translated into English. Um, the characters in that I cast, I cast multiple characters in the same role, as well as use multiple translations of the same work to make sure that, because the point is not to, again, as a way to undermine my, not only my authority, but all authority, anyone's authority. Um, the, there's jokes in this, you know, like the Lawrence Welk thing, I've taken a Bryce Marden painting and dissected it and turned it into a dress, into a decorative motif. I've made the wound in her chest from a Lucha Fontana painting. So they're, they're like, art history jokes. This is 16 feet by 8 feet. It's called the High House Low. It also has a television magnifying glass in it. Um, and also, I think this piece illustrates something that's very clearly a schism that is throughout the entire body of work, which is something I read about from Ann Carson's translations of classical work, and it has to do with scale and the schism between the, the sublime, the gods, or in our case, you know, I don't believe in God, but I, nature, the universe, um, uni the universe is uh, M, uh, not ambivalence, but it has no regard for me, you know, and that's the, and, you know, the, it, when people, humans brush up against the sublime, they're often destroyed. This is a painting, which is quite huge as a backdrop for photography and a backdrop for an exhibition. These are called Thursus. Thursus for Eno is, and I don't know which one actually, is in the collection here. The Thursus is a symbol of Dionysus. Oh, this one? And the, they are, they're adjustable, um, they're props, they're staging, and they use 
those same tools. This is another thyrsus. This is a piece called uh, something, something about the ribs, something about tearing. There's a rib cage here. The sculpture is, a, is the moment, another presentation of the moment that Agave, the mother of Pentheus, rips his arm out of his body. And I imagined making a sculpture as if this is a story we tell and all we have left is the fringe from the skirt of the murderer. And we've built this tableau sort of to remember. This is called Tearing Flesh from Bone. It's another aunt who tears flesh from bone. This is Swarming Over, another aunt. This is called Her House Smoldering, and it's this, it is a very t t huge. And it's the wall, the moment in the wall of Thebes that was struck by lightning where Semele was killed, and now Dionysus sends flowers to, to grow in her honor. Oops, sorry. This is called Alas. This is a mobile, and it has hanging parts, and it's made of all trash. Like, it's made of a gazebo and an eel trap. But, but at a certain view, it comes together to create a skull, which is sort of like a, which is an image in the play. It's a hallucination that the king has. After working with antiquity for maybe 12 to a dozen years, I thought I wanted to work with something modern, so that, because I was like, this, my project isn't about antiquity. Um, it is about translation but I wanted to go deeper into really understanding why I was working with Euripides. That, that, so I decided to work, after reading a lot, I decided to work with the literature of Antonin Artaud. Um, and I picked a play that was written in 1932 about, it was a science fiction play about the end of the world in the distant year 2000. Um, the star, Basically, a star collides with the Earth, and we know it's happening. It's kind of like melancholia, um, but it's a satire, and it's a takedown of every sort of thing we depend on as a society, institutionally, um, philosophically, practically. I made three, five major billboards for this body of work, and each one examines a different aspect of anxiety. This one is the social. I can't, I can't remember these titles. All the titles come from the literature and are, are um, references to sound. And like this is like something about street sounds and yelling and something. And it's a combination of composite faces and my friends and fashion and history and... Sorry, the clicker is a little slow. Um, this is, I would say this is an uh, ontological anxiety. Questions of existence, theology, philosophy. Um, and I'm, oh, it's called, it's called, no, no. <laughs> the titles are quite poetic because they're not my words. Um, and um, it has something to do with sound as well. A lot of this work, actually, and Artaud's work in general, was about the, the conflation and combination of sound and visual, and it's very assaultive. And um, so the, there are many references like that within the work. This is called The Plague, and it has to do with bodily anxiety our anxieties about physicality or our vulnerability. The references are bodily, they're also medical. They're about war, violence. This is about an anxiety about information and the dispersal of information. It's called There Is No More Firmament, and it depicts, oh, this one actually, I think this is interesting, this story, 
to give you a sense of how these images are made in not j I made I photographed this whole scene is actually a photograph of my friends carrying a friend of mine on a stretcher and then I simply collage over that so the images are eight feet by 12 foot and then embedded within that is all these images and the text describes the moment the body is carried past on a stretcher. This is called Dirty Fog, and it has to do with environmental anxiety, contamination, eight feet by 12 feet. And in this case, with a lot of, with these, this whole body of work, because uh, Arto is very interested in um, the f the body as a transcending the body and, talk and thinking about his organs, and I decided to treat the artworks as if they had bodies. So instead of just building outward, I carved into the works and would sort of embed orifices, mouths, fruits. And then this is a series of work that I'm not going to describe. It's all there is no more firmament. And it's all scenes, imagines, speculations about the play. They veer towards abstraction because the world ends. And it, I mean, it, actually, the fifth movement of the play is never written. So we don't know if the world ends. Um, but I took that as an opportunity to blow up the world and make abstraction. This is about a mother's anxiety, a, a child is seated in the middle. There's not a detail of this, I bet. But he's like asking him, mother, mother, what's going on? And then there's all these voices screaming. And this is funny. This is an, an eye beauty contest where these people are looking from behind the painting to look at you, but you can just see their eyes. This is called Revolutionary Song. And these are paintings made from, it's about, again, maybe eight feet tall, 11 feet wide, painted with collage. Sort of like a um, Last Judgment kind of vibe. These are ceramics embedded in a piece that's like about sort of like the bull in the china shop, a riot. Yeah, these are all There's No More Firmament. I think I worked on There's No More Firmament for four years too. This is also before the pandemic, which feels so weird. It was before Trump. And there's a, these, there's a character called the Great Sniffer. And I don't know if you remember, but Trump was sniffing during his debates, and I thought that was so peculiar because the great sniffer was a demagogue. Mm -hmm. That's collage. Yeah, so these images are actually two works of art that I took pictures of in Berlin that are ivory carvings of the Last Judgment and some other thing like that. They're two different biblical events. I, and I simply put the photograph on the foam and carved away everything that was carved in the real image and then created a sort of scene around it. So it has the, it's like a simulation of an 16th century carving. And then this is tons of photographs of these same small objects and one is actually in the Kemper, I think, or like an encyclopedic museum in the middle of the country and somewhere. And um, 
So this is just that same little object. But what I'm trying to do is like take in the same way that I photograph a person, photograph a work of art that is this big and looks kind of quaint and like we're kind of accustomed to seeing. And like in the same way that I was trying to embed gestural abstraction with narrative drama, be like, this is what is in my mind when I'm looking at this little ivory carving. And then after I finished that series, I, I wanted to do um, another play. I've been wanting to work with Jean Genet for a long time. Um, and it occurred to me, so, and I, I didn't get into this, but Artaud's anxiety is, I think of Artaud as a contemporary of Euripides, that Euripides was sort of like the, the groundbreaking anxious tragedian. And, um, Jean Genet, when I read The Balcony, which is, uh, I'm going to read a little description of The Balcony to make it short so I don't. Um, the Balcony is a play about a revolution and what happens in a brothel during a revolution. Um, the set of Jean Genet's Balcony or play The Balcony, felt uncannily familiar to me. Madame Irma's Balcony is an extravagant brothel, a house of illusion, complete with studio sets, authentic costumes, props, and changing scripts where clientele can indulge any fantasy, however baroque or banal. This is my description. Over the course of the play, the tumult of revolution encroaches on this floating world, un until an unlikely counter-revolution and puppet-like government emerges from Irma's house, broken house of mirrors. Citizens who once paid to play act, judge, bishop, soldier, with the help of Irma's seasoned consort, now seize the roles in earnest as she herself takes on the role of the remote and unseen queen. In scene 12, Genet sends in the trendiest photographers so the camera can canonize as the queen's envoy looks on a true image born of false spectacle. For the past three years, I have made work about Antonin Artaud's 1932 blah, blah, blah. There's no more firmament. It takes place in the blah, blah, blah. But what, I, what occurred to me was I can imagine Genet's balcony as a vignette in Artaud's collapsing firmament. So I picked this play because I started to realize as I'm moving through literature of the world, I'm creating sort of decade-long collage of references and sort of building a new cosmology um, that is arbitrary. You know, it's my own. Um, and I made this piece, the piece, the, the way I... Think of I perform these plays by making artworks, and this is the backdrop, which is 40 feet long by eight feet, and it basically depicts the, 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 the city, the unknown city where the play takes place and everything that's happening. And I made this piece, this is like a time capsule for me, I made this piece in the pandemic. This is my sort of 2020 life. And um, it depicts the images are, you know, my people, my life, my loved ones acting out the people in the brothel and the clients and the roles and the who, who's a bishop, who's a judge, but also um, scenes of why we gather and and that was particularly apparent at this time when we couldn't gather. Funerals, demonstrations, celebrations, um, riots, elections. And that there was a, I, what the piece is really about is blending all of these sort of moments of community, which can, which are subjective and can be seen as, you know, one man's, what looks like a riot is another person's celebration. What is a funeral could easily devolve into a riot. Um, or, and I should have said demonstration versus, you know, something negative or positive. Um, but I wanted to show the the fluidity and subjectivity, not only of our 
personal emotions and psychology as I've done in the past, but also of our communal relationships. And then this figure in the, the yellow represents the brothel and the balcony is a threshold theatrical space where at the end of the play, the clients of the brothel who have been paying and pretending to be the bishop, the judge, the people of power, um, when those people are in, assassinated in truth, the um, consort of the queen brings out these clients of the brothel dressed the part and they say the revolution is unsuccessful and those people become earnestly the seats of power. So the play is really a critique of power, but it's also a template for seizing power. And this is the bishop. I didn't do details of these, There's too many. General. And these are not about people, they're about the artifice, the accoutrement, the... A queen is not a queen, she is a costume. This is the queen. This is the exhibition, and there was a giant chandelier hanging in the gallery because the one set piece, whether you're inside or outside in Jean Genet's play, a chandelier hangs over everything to signify that it's all within the studio. It's all within the fantasy. And then this is that show that Catherine referred to that I did last year at Regan Projects in Los Angeles. Um, and I, it was a 20-year survey, so you'll see in the installation shots many of the artworks that were, you know, like this is, we saw initially. And I, um, because all these artworks are from various works of literature and all have different meanings, I felt that it was my responsibility to sort of, not responsibility, it would behoove me to show the, the connection. So I made these temporary interstitial collages pinned to the walls. I covered the walls of the gallery in foam and did these sort of on-site temporary works to show um, what I believe to be the connections between stories and uh, discrete objects, which also undermines the authority of the individual object. Yes. So, sorry, I'm, I'm doing my phone because I have a timer on to make sure I'm not too long. I'm al almost done. Um, you, Amy asked about the making of the work, and she said that the, the quantity seems almost like impossible. <sighs> what do you, I mean, I, I like to work. I don't make this work to the reason I make this work is because I actually like to sit and do this stuff. It's not because I want the work to look this way. It's because this is what makes me happy. And this is how I think. And, you know, I said I'm not a good editor. I haven't edited this d presentation, and I don't really edit my shows. They are the complete... You know, some other artists will... You know, there's a lot of work that will go unseen, that's not, that's not my life. I mean, I do make a lot of artwork that I don't show. But the work, you know what I mean? Like, I show the, the, the work for good, better or worse. And, and it's, I don't bother making sense and being like, I'm, you know, I spoke with students today, like, about how much we assert control over our production. And I, I choose not to. Does that help clarify? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I want it to be hard to wrap your head around because the subject is 
the sublime. And the subject is anxiety. And anxiety, you know, there's an there's the sublime, which is like, oh, this when we look at this seascape, there's sublime, but then and that's peaceful, but there's another sublime which is horrifying and nauseous. And that's the subject I'm talking about is, you know, my mother, I, my, I called my mother, I said, what, how, how are you? Uh, she goes, I had one of those nights where every regret of my life paraded across the foot of the bed. <laughs> and I was like, I mean, I was, I was like, oh, that, that resonates. <laughs> like, that's, <laughs> that's a painting. So, and also, there is a kind of, like, this is a childish reference, but a choose-your-own-adventure. There's, in this, in my artwork, there is every path untaken. You know, or this movie that's coming out that I haven't seen, that's a Marvel movie about somebody's web, that we, I speculated, I watched myself on the internet do this lecture six, seven years ago, and speculated about the 20 lectures I might give tonight. You know, like, all of them are included in my artwork. And, you know, metaphorically. This is actually my lecture, so it's, it's, I'm done. <laughs> now, there, there are more images. This is one exhibition, yeah. Yeah. That's correct, yeah. So this piece was actually made for Prospect, and one of the clarifying, because Prospect is in New Orleans, the subject of, I went to Mardi Gras, which was the Mardi Gras that made the pandemic, and or like seeded the pandemic, and um, I, so it was about, Mar Mardi Gras and parade as balcony spectacle, you know, the subject is New Orleans. And then, you know, there's all these chandeliers and the paintings in this room are abstraction, gestural abstraction, but they're also, I made the subject, the chandeliers, like I painted the sort of accumulation of lines to create space and tumbleweeds and and then there are these benches I make these bench sculptures as a way to create um, interactivity tactility usually there's sculptures that go on them but I remove them in this case um, anyway I could we'll talk about that the one thing this is the last little image and it's there's a hallway at Regan and I wanted to fill it because I love filling everything and it's very thin and I w thought about my balcony piece and how it was this long procession you know just like a parade to see it you walk left to right and back and forth and then I thought about this hallway and what's an experience that where I could give someone the experience of the hallway as a procession so I I put I make ceramics with a friend and I put drawings that I make as a daily practice. I basically made a procession that is on the shelf and autobiographical about my daily life and my daily practices, the sort of private aspects of my art production that inform and underpin this more public theatrical um, endeavor. Because I think the scale, again, it's a question of scale. The artworks in the hallway are really just for me but I'm sharing them in this instant. And then I just included this because I'm, I'm venturing into op art, but I don't know about it yet. That's it. So hi, everyone. Um, we are now going to open it up to Q&A. So if you have any questions, please raise your hand, and Max um, will hand over the mic. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you for the lecture. 
Um, I'm very interested in your process of accumulation. And I was just wondering um, if you could share more about, you know, what that process looks like, mm. seeking the material, collecting it, where you find it, and if, you know, the source carries meaning into the work. Hmm, it does. And actually, that's a really good question for me because it makes me realize I forgot to say something important, which is this whole, the conceit of this entire exhibition is that I wanted to recreate in a, a, a simulation of my home and studio, which you saw a little vignette of behind that person and that thing. But it's like, basically, this is what my house looks like. And my house is a repository of decades of accumulation. And um, initially, I would go out into the world and look for inspiration and um, buy everything I could or literally root through dumpsters and, I mean, everything. Uh, and then I filled up my whole house and um, there's a limit. And so I've stopped and I just started working because I could just have to deal with what I have, which is an excess. But what's happened is now people bring me truckloads of things because they know, everybody knows now. And I, in a way it's like, it's kind of incredible that you like, I see it as very, it's very moving to me. It's very beautiful because it's like you look for something, you look for something and then, and then the world creates a ecosystem where now I sit still and it, people just come to me with, you know, drop off carloads full of materials. Um, so that there's been a transformation in the, that, input thank you for the generosity and expansiveness of your lecture um, I was curious if you could talk a little bit about you mentioned working with friends and family a little bit about the role of collaboration and participation in your practice I I think it's analogous to collage and literature. I don't know how to make something up. I don't have the kind of mind that just generates rich ideas. But I can rearrange circumstance and material and learn about it and transform it. And my relationship to community whether it's people bringing me materials or modeling for my photographs or helping me make ceramics or helping me make artwork is a part of that. So it's like incorporating, you know, the photo shoot is really authored by the subject. I simply give them prompts, but they create the you know, it's like working with an actor. And I, if I were a film director, I would n not control an actor. Um, so for me, it's a way to exceed the limitations of my singular mind. Limited mind. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. <clears throat> this was really lovely tonight. I'd love to know a little bit more about a couple slides ago, you had some, I think you called them chandeliers, almost yeah. like sculptural installations that were hanging from the ceiling that almost look ethereal, like if a breeze mm -hmm. went through the room, they wouldn't exist anymore. Are those created for that room in that exhibit mm -mm. or do they have another life afterwards? They actually were made over the course of 12 years. 
all for different shows. Um, they're pinned together like the other work, but um, you know, they're stable. They couldn't live outside, but they're, I'm trying to think what they would be comparable to. They're like baskets. What types of materials are So these? it's mostly metal armatures with plastic tubing pinned into nets that create forms, which are basically like baskets, but they're clear so that they can be wrapped around the neon, which I also make with a neon bender. And he, he actually makes the neon from my drawings. Amazing, thank you. You're welcome. One, yes? Oh wait, Mike. I can repeat it too. Thank you. I just find these so magical. And I wonder if it ever occurs to you about what the life expectancy of these different pieces are after you've made them. Um, <clears throat> yes. My goal, my threshold, is a minimum of 100 years. That's my... And I feel like they could last longer, but they will need some, you know, upkeep. Um, need a little uh, moisturizer. <laughs> but I, I create, I've figured out way, I used to be kind of purist, like when I was in school, I was kind of, at the time I felt more like I had a sort of punk kind of attitude where like, like aggressively destructive. But now I am much more concerned with mortality and um, so consequently I've created systems to create the illusion of fragility. So I glue every pen um, I, cre I create, you know, I use archival materials. I do all these things to make normal, you know, physicality, ephemeral physicality stronger. Because I don't want them to fall apart now that I feel like I'm falling apart. Yeah. So uh, um, what type of camera do you use for your photos do you use like polaroids for the small ones that you cut people out of or you send them out for print and then for the large large plotted canvases that you work over top of uh do you plot did you find a plotter that prints that large or do you piece those together yeah um i use normal normal digital photography now I used to use normal film um not fancy development all standardized, and then print the big prints on rice paper, and they're just printed huge, like inkjet printing. But I actually have to cut them apart again to glue them. Is there one more question? Nope. I really appreciate everybody listening. Thank you.